19th. So it's been over six months now. It's been six and a half months. So I went to the city council of Milpitas and brought an MOU of a, a, a single sheet, double side printing, uh, memorandum of understanding. And these are basically the key components of it. You know, there's the whereas, whereas, whereas section, but that boils down to whereas we've got bad congestion and it can be mitigated with uh, advanced transit technology. Therefore, and these are like the, the main points of the MOU that I'm trying to get the city council to agree to. Uh, currently, we're using uh, the name Loopworks uh, for our operational name. Uh, before we, you know, this just is kind of a, something to hang our name on here. Um, and we're going to be building a locally owned and operated BART circulator. So that's the, that's the game plan. Major design decisions will be from cooperative input of residents, civic and business groups, and others in the area that are stakeholders. The construction costs and building costs. This is another place where this project is kind of unusual. The first being, hey, this is not going to be a privately owned toll road kind of thing. This is not going to be a privately owned airplane kind of thing, air service. This is not going to be a publicly owned VTA bus service. This is something in between where we've got a, a public benefit corporation that's actually running it for the benefit of the community. And for any of you that are uh, not living in San Jose and have recently had your electricity switched over from PG&E to Silicon Valley Clean Energy, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. SVCE is a type B corporation that is taking that 20% profit that pmg and &E used to get from selling you electricity, and they're using it to subsidize programs that make our lives better. Um, capital. This was the other thing. Uh, generally, capital for building this kind of stuff comes from transportation agencies, or if it's a private company, and the private company does it. We're looking to contact those foundations and other agencies that have an interest in either one, reducing CO2 emissions, or two, improving transit operations and uh, facilitating public transit. Uh, we're talking about a $60 million project. That's not a lot of money in terms of how much uh, money these foundations and organizations have. So we think that it's probably feasible to get all of the capital costs essentially for free. OPM, other people's money, I love it. Uh, the goal of free service, subsidized, uh, we prefer local businesses that pay prevailing wages. So uh, again, because we're a type B corporation, we're not looking to make the, you know, the, do it on the cheap. We can afford to you know, pay prevailing wages and make sure this thing's done right. And it will also give us a lot of good numbers. Uh, and we, part of the, we will be demonstrating transparency and accountability, and including uh, some of the emails that I've sent to uh, city council members. What's the next one say here? Economic benefits. So um, we need to kind of update this $38 million by striking out this first one because the city and VTA have agreed to build a $14 million pedestrian overcrossing of Montague Expressway that will connect the bar parking lot, it's a structure, parking structure, across Montague Expressway to some retail operations and some housing on the other side. <laughs> um, Milpitas apparently somehow got snookered into you know paying about four and a half million of this. I ran some numbers using a fifteen million dollar a mile figure for this technology, and it turns out that for about two and a half million dollars, we could probably use this technology to provide a, you know, a way of getting across Montague Expressway, just kind of like a horizontal elevator kind of deal. Uh, they weren't interested. Uh, but they still have another Montague Expressway POC on the books. Um, maybe I should go back. Oh, here it is. So this is Montague Expressway. And we need a crossing 
this way for the housing, the, the folks in the housing here to get over the parking store. I think I may have that out earlier that there was a space there. Anyway, they are still planning on building a POC there. And there's also another one that's needed uh, right up here. Why there, Bob? Because for those of us like me that live right about here in Milpitas, to get across to the west side of Milpitas, these railroad tracks are in the way. Mm -hmm. Until you get down to Montague here, or up to Calaveras Boulevard up there, which is about a mile and a third, mile and a half north. Right in the middle, almost exactly, is Yosemite Drive, which has bicycle lanes on it, and I can come down, you know, from my home up down Yosemite, get down to here, and I can throw a rock across this line here. But that's what I've been working on for 25 years, is to get a crossing there. <laughs> but we still need a crossing. And in fact, we were going through our uh, updates of transportation elements and such, and that's going to become one of the issues, is to talk about that. So, because if we were to build the PRT project, then we wouldn't really need either of those two crossings, because people could just get on the PRT system to get over these barriers. Um, then we get into some of the numbers, uh, if, if you're looking at it from the city of Milpitas perspective, you're saying, hey, if a 1% increase in property values happens because we put in a $60 million uh, advanced transit system into your neck of your neighborhood, then that means that the, there will be a 1% increase in the annual property tax revenues from those properties to the city. So you think that the city might say, hmm, more right? That sounds good to me. They haven't yet. Uh, and then, of course, there's the difficult to measure value of increased tourism at what is undoubtedly going to be a PRT attraction, mm -hmm. uh, especially since it's kind of combined with the Great Mall, which in itself is trying to develop itself more as an attraction, not just a shopping center, but also an entertainment complex. Uh, then we've got uh, public health and safety benefits. The, uh, we would really like to see more people walking and cycling, but this area is so sliced and diced by two railroad tracks, two major roadways, and a creek that it's actually difficult to get around there easily on foot or on bicycle. Otherwise, you're shunted onto these major roadways, which are not particularly safe. But if you're in an elevated guideway, cab, and you're self-contained and it just opens the door and you get in and you get out just like an elevator. An elevator's pretty darn safe nowadays out here. <laughs> and then we've got jobs and careers. And I draw a distinction here because a job is when you build this system. That's a short-term, you know, one, two-year kind of thing. A career is if you participate in the design and or manufacture of any components of this system. And that's likely to happen. Um, when the called street cars, I guess that's what they called them back in the, the 19, early 1900s. They were just, one was introduced someplace and within 10 years it was happening all across the country. I anticipate a similar kind of response to this kind of technology. Once we get the first one up and running, you're going to see, well, just locally, we know that Santa Cruz, mm -hmm. Sunnyvale, Mountain View, I think Palo Alto, certainly San Jose, and, and the airport have all been looking at PRT technology. Mm -hmm. And they're all ready to take the first step. And as I've said for the last 15 years, this is not an engineering problem. This is not a money problem. This is strictly a political problem, which is why we haven't been able to get one of these built in the dozens of places across the country where residents and advocates for PRT technology have been fighting to get something built. Just get us something built here so people can see how you know, we can get some hard numbers. And that, um, frankly, is probably the most valuable aspect of this project 
is that once we build it, we will have some hard numbers. We'll be able to say, oh, Rob, that $15 million a mile number that you came up with, you know, after you get past the first couple of miles, it really drops down to $12 million a mile. Or it costs $18 million a mile. But we'll get some hard numbers as to what the heck is really going on. Economic benefits. Oh, just read an article that's saying that we ought to be talking more about the risks involved in not dealing with our climate emergency. And of course, that's what's contained here in this line, where if we have a runaway situation, we're really screwed. Okay, so I guess this here's part of the end. And we'll go into the Q and A, and which I'm sure will dig out some more information for y'all. Uh, we're talking about reducing the CO2 emissions by converting over uh, our, you know, mostly gas-powered stuff that's going on. And, and one of the things that occurs to me is all those people driving all those kids to that grammar school in this area. Um, maybe we'll be able to get some of that this technology is safe enough for their kids to actually get on. We'll see. But that would really make a significant dent in the emissions in this particular area, maybe dropping them by about 10% uh, due to you know, getting people out of their cars and providing them a real convenient option for getting around the area. Uh, obviously, improving public health, safety, air quality, mitigating some of the traffic congestion. I say mitigate because there is no way we are going to really reduce the traffic congestion in Milpitas because this is a regional problem. Milpitas and Fremont happen to be the ports of entry, shall we say, to Silicon Valley. And uh, if one of them has a little bit of a reduction in its demand, that demand will be made up by the other out the other streams of traffic that want to take take advantage of, oh, we got a little bit quicker down there on Money and Expressways. Do that. Uh, that's free and fun. I, I put this fun in here because in my mind anyway, from having uh, been on a couple of rides at Disneyland and whatnot, being up and moving along and looking down is fun. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it gives you a different view of things. It's, uh, anyway, I, anyway. Well, maybe I should do an audience check on that. Is that a legitimate thing to say? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so. Upper level is fun. Okay, great, great. I'll stick with that. So obviously start with the mini loop, then extend with the bar circulator. Uh, we're at the point of trying to get support from the public for this project because we've got, and this gets to, Brian asked me earlier, what's going on with the city council? Aren't they all on board with this? And I'm saying, no, they're not all on board with this. We've got two that are on board. We've got one that is definitely not on board because he won't even meet with me even though I repeatedly asked for a meeting. And then we've got two who have met with me and they asked questions, I provided information. One of them is punting, waiting for a uh, traffic analysis report that may come out in December. And the other one wants to say no, but can't do it for a good reason. So um, anyway, and I think one of those two would probably flip if it was actually presented to them in the public forum of the city council meeting. Mm -hmm. So we're working to get that to happen, and that has been a challenge, and I won't go into how dysfunctional our city council is at the moment. Do you, do you, have, any, do you have any idea about the people who are resistant? Is there any of their reasons or anything? Sure. Okay. So, uh, you know, the. The problem is that they, there's a presenting reason and then there's the real reason. Mm -hmm. And the presenting reason is, oh, Rob, well, I'm concerned about this or what about that. Mm -hmm. You know, the last one, for example, I got from Carmen Montano, I think, was about O&M. She wanted to say, oh, how's O&M going to be handled? Mm -hmm. Well, excuse me, I'm not asking for any dollars from the city to start off with. But to answer your question, yeah, we're going to have O&M costs. Mm -hmm. But instead of the 3 to 5% of capital costs that most transit agencies incur because of the way they do business, basically their technology, mm -hmm. that is dramatically higher than the 1% that I'm anticipating 
with this technology. So 1% of the $60 million project means that every year I've got to come up with $600,000 to pay for the O&M. Don't know if I'll be able to do that with free rides, but I'd like to at least try. 1%, well, that's a lot less than 3 to 5%. How the hell do you come there? Part of the reason is the 70% that's not going to all of the uh, drivers driving vehicles around. Part of it is going to uh, fuel costs. Garrick's got a fault out there. When he drives on electricity, it costs him X dollars per mile. When he drives on gasoline, it costs him 2X dollars per mile. Am I correct on that? Have you ever run the numbers? Maybe 3X. Yeah, or 3x for gas. Well, when we get, when we get uh, carbon taxes, that will definitely be true. So uh, we've reduced the, 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 the staffing costs dramatically. We've reduced the fuel costs substantially. And then there is the sheer maintenance of these vehicles. If it's an electric drive on a captured guideway, which it is, and you're running pneumatic tires at 80 PSI, um, there's not a lot of moving parts that are going to wear out. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you get an internal combustion engine, you've got how many parts that are in there? Like 2,000, 1,000 waste. I mean, you know, washers and push rods and cams. And there's lots of parts that can wear out and go south. So anyway, low cost, that's why I think that I can get away with the 1% number. So I need $600,000. So that's what I sent back to Carmen. And then she wrote that she has other concerns, okay. unspecified, mm -hmm. which is why I think that she really wants to say no. She just can't come up with a good reason. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, sir. The, you have somebody in mind who I was on a bit metal and put this together. <clears throat> so what are you asking from the city? Permits? Or? I'm asking from the city the, uh, let's see. Well, hey, hey, let's just <coughs> is. See, is that this one? No, that's that. That would probably be, let's try this. Whereas, whereas, whereas. What was the question again? What does the city have to give you, provide you? I mean, I, I asked it. Gotcha. So it's simply permits. Okay, let's see here. Cooperating with the yeah, The city expects the cooperative will need a year or more to reach agreements with other property owners and line up the funding required before approaching the city with the signs. <clears throat> oh, I think the real plot statement is up here. Let's go back here. And it's effective, you know, essentially effective for a couple of years. And we'll monitor progress as we go along. But this is really it. The city encourages the project outlined in the PRT poster. Hereby indicating the intention to grant a franchise for such a project when presented to the city in accordance with the following expectations. So we've gone through the expectations. The franchise agreement, the way uh, state law is, it says that uh, you know, cities can uh, grant franchises for uh, transit operations. So this provides the ability for somebody to come in and put a streetcar line, for example. Now, they anticipate that things will go a certain way, and that's why the law is written that way, and therefore we're kind of constrained by it. But the law basically says that once the uh, request for quotes goes out from the city and they get the responses back and they choose somebody, from that point, there's 90 days until you have to break ground. 90 days. So basically, we have to get everything lined up ahead of time before we come back to uh, basically all these uh, all these property owners because they're all going to have to buy in and if they're public agencies they're going to be having to go through this franchise agreement process also. Um, does that answer your question? I think so. Do you need 
this franchise agreement. Yeah, but that yeah, that comes downstream. Right now, I'm trying to get from the city of Mill Peters the permission to move forward on this. I mean, at some point you're going to want to. I want to put a post here. I want to put a. At some point, I would want to do that. That comes after. Station somewhere else. That comes after I get permission from the property owners, and after I get money to actually do the design work. So I'm not concerned about where the heck I'm going to put the pole, frankly, because 60 to 90 feet gives me a lot of fluff. Plus, we can, you know, zigzag and move around things pretty easily. In fact, there's a spot coming through the, uh, the Great Mall. There's a big building here, which is otherwise known as the theater complex, and then there's like 15, 20 feet away, there's another big building, and there's just this narrow walkway from the back parking lot into the, the plaza for the theaters. And I would really like to bring the PRT right through that narrow area slowing those vehicles that were going 30 miles per hour down to probably in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 miles per hour as they wind their way through that tight narrow zone and these tight turns. Again, it would be a neat ride once we really get this up. <laughs> yes, sir. I've got, I'm an engineer. I've got a number of questions. Techie questions. Hardware, Techie questions. hardware or software? Uh, utilization is one question. So. Okay. This is a one-way system, right? The vehicles only go around the loop one way. Correct. So if you want to get to the station behind you, you have to get on and go around the loop. Right. Now, at yeah, that will 30 miles an hour and however many miles, it's what, seven to eight minutes?